Well, first of all, I want to thank you for the invitation to come to North Georgia. They were asking me last night, why did you, why did you accept this invitation? Because I said, I want to see where North Georgia is. I don't, I've never heard of it. It's a beautiful area, so thank you, and thank you for uh, spending your Saturday, in a sense, engaging in this intersection between science, uh, spirituality, and culture. Um, I think today it's going to be a lot. It's a, I tell a story. It's a journey. Because our story is a rather complex one. And I think sometimes we're a little bit, we, we kind of want to reduce things to this or that. And I don't think, I don't think our story can be uh, so quickly reduced to just one phase of things. You know, either it's religion or it's science. Um, and so let me just begin with sort of our real situation. Uh, this is a scene from Houston, Texas, a few months ago, where they had disastrous floods. And of course, we, it was followed up by tremendous flooding in um, Puerto Rico, the wildfires in California. We've uh, witnessed recent events of um, deep racial conflicts. And so, you know, we, we wonder what's happening to our Earth. Here, I'm just going to take the Earth sort of as a lens, so to speak, to speak of a what I would call a radical disconnectedness from the whole. Um, Pope Francis, uh, in his encyclical Laudato Si, really tries to raise the bar of our awareness to say, you know, this earth is in crisis. We're in a, we're in a critical situation that if we continue in our patterns, we can expect uh, dire consequences. I mean, the earth, um, the warming trend is causing species depletion species that have taken millions of years to evolve. Now, once they're extinct, that is it. Uh, the North Pole is, you know, the, um, Antarctica is melting. The glaciers are melting. And that's going to have profound consequences for uh, species or um, migration uh, and other things. And of course, the poor are being displaced uh, pr pr uh, disproportionately by this. It, even in 1990, and why do I bring this up? Because the ecological or the environmental question is not a new one. We've known about this uh, for many, many years. 1990, a group of scientists came together and said, you know, we're close to committing crimes against creation. And so that's now, you know, almost 30 years ago that, you know, this was uttered. And yet, the fact is that we continue in our lifestyles. Uh, we continue the same patterns. And there's something that's not, that's not kind of getting through. Uh, that, you know, even though we hear of, and we're experiencing, quite honestly, uh, unusual weather patterns. And some people can say, say, oh, well, you know, that's just the environment. It's always been this way. Well, sure, nature has different, you know, weather patterns. That's not the question. It's the, it's the, um, the, the change of them, the rapid change and the, and the extreme changes now in weather patterns that's becoming different. That is due to, to warming. And truthfully, I don't know about here in North Georgia, but in Washington, D.C., or even in Villanova, where I, I now teach, uh, it's a one-person car country. You know, everyone's in their one-person car going to, to their job or to the store. And so, uh, hey, you don't have to be a scientist to figure out if you have put so many automobiles on the road, you know, and you're going to have a number of carbons in the atmosphere that uh, weren't normally there before. So this is, in a sense, affecting our quality of life. Here's the bottom line that our footprint, I don't know if you've taken the footprint test, but the footprint is the amount of resources that it takes to live, just get up in the morning and have a normal day of life. Um, everything from where we drive, how we drive, do we walk, what kind of foods we eat, our footprint in this country is about 23% larger than what the Earth can regenerate. So if everyone were to live like a North American, it would take about six planets. Um, and as far as we know, we just, you know, we don't have other inhabitable planets that can sustain our lifestyles at this point. Maybe someday, I think we're working on that. So Elon Musk, for one, is you know, ready to launch a space station X. But um, how, did we, how did we come to this kind of, um, it's really, hey, you know, nature's nature. What do I have to really worry about anything warming? Well, you know, part of the problem, I do think, is religion. A problem insofar as this. We are 21st century people with a medieval cosmo religious cosmology. So, you know, functionally, we're living in this very fast-paced scientific technological world. Religiously, 
we're about between the 13th and 16th centuries. Um, and, and where, in a sense, religion sort of grew up, I mean, it, it grew up in the early centuries of the Christian church, but I mean, I think it sort of flowered in the 13th century. And, and this was the cosmos in the 13th century, just so we have a, you know, kind of get the idea in mind. Notice it's, you know, it's, it's lovely. It's, you know, circular, static, you know, very concentric. God's hand overseeing everything, you know, the power of God that ordains everything, that creates, places everything. Um, the earth is the center. So this is a perfect, immutable, immutable, geocentric cosmos, right? Earth is center, and where are we? Hey, we're at the center of the center, right? We are created in the image of God, the noble center of the earth. And, you know, if we were living in the 13th century, um, that kind of worked at that point in the sense that, you know, we had this sense of God um, beyond us. God here, we could see the footprints of God in creation. There was a, a consonance, you might say, between the, the microcosm and the macrocosm. Um, but, you know, we also developed a story early on about, you know, what was good and not so good. And the story went, you know, it was good. You know, we were born into this lovely garden. Then it wasn't so good because, you know, we fell into sin, and then it was good again because Jesus came and saved us. So good, not good, good. Order, sin, redemption, you know, is basically how we've seen it. And, you know, if we were to put this in another framework, we can say, well, you know, we have this, again, this, um, and we still talk like this, right? This our, when we talk, when I hear people talking about religion, it, we're, out of, we're talking out of this cosmos, right? Because we're saying, here we are, we're at the center, where's my little pointer thing? We're at the center, you know. I'm going to try this out now, technology. Here we are, center. Oh, there we are, center, right? And we're going, okay, so when I die, what do I do? I'm going to go to heaven and spend with God. Not so good, we're going to the great deep. And thanks to Dante, we know what, what's in that deep. It's not pretty. So, and here's our God. You know, God is the geometer, right, from the Middle Ages. You know, God is ordering all things. Don't worry, God knows. <clears throat> That's our language. God knows everything, and, um, you know, God indeed may, but we're pretty sure that God has it all mapped out for us. We just, we just pay, pray, and obey, as we say in the Catholic Church. So <clears throat> what, you know, in a sense, what this, here's the good news about this cosmos. Um, it had a space for the soul to stretch. I'm going to put it in that language. What's beautiful about the medieval cosmos is especially why I think we were attracted still by that literature, and I love it, you know. There's something about this, this yearning, this desire, and this kind of idea that, you know, that we're surrounded by the heavens. Um, you know, the uh, churches in the Middle Ages and beyond began to build these churches with, you know, the Romanesque domes or the Gothic cathedral, you know, with the large high ceilings. Because the sense that there's a heaven, there's a space beyond that my soul can be lifted up into that space. Um, and therefore, here's a little snippet from the, um, the Washington Cathedral here. I don't know if you've been to that in D.C. Episcopalian Cathedral, beautiful, beautiful. It's, it's Gothic, it's, it's pseudo-Dionysius, you know, writ into stone. Uh, where you walk in, and, you know, your attention is lifted up. I mean, you're not really looking at the, the beautiful floor. Your, your attention is drawn by the very high ceilings. And light pours in from above and therefore lifts us up to God, you know. So you see everyone walking around like this, right, like this. And uh, that's because they pl place these beautiful stained glass windows all the way up, right? And they even have a moon rock window there. It is very, very neat, you know. I don't know if it's for real or, you know, where they got that moon rock, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that it's really from the moon and it's rock. Um, <clears throat> but here's the thing. This kind of lifting up to, from earth to heaven, you know, how many songs, you can think about the songs you sing, you know, on a Sunday service. Uh, you know, and a mighty fortress is our God. Oh, God, you who reign above. Beautiful language. But you know, as the, the saying goes, our, our, the way we pray, the law of prayer, lex orandi, is what we believe, right? Prayer shapes our belief, credende. And then how we believe is how we live. And so our, you know, st structure, religious structure, religious language, shaping our thought, 
shaping, therefore, our way of life. And, of course, even depicted in, in kind of iconography in terms of, you know, ladders going to heaven. So we're, you know, we're climbing, we're, we're here, and we're to climb up, in a sense, ascend the ladder to God. Um, and given the cosmology of this age, this was indeed a very compatible spirituality. But here is where you might say the rubber meets the road. Because, uh, you know, in 1967, the historian Lynn White said, you know, the ecological crisis, he said, is, is really rooted in Christianity. We became ambivalent with regard to the natural world. Uh, we focused our, our attention on heaven, on the things of God. And in a sense, all but, you know, humans became excluded from grace. So he says, the problems of ecology are religious, uh, the roots are religious, and the, re the remedy must be religious as well. Now that's kind of interesting. And um, what's, uh, again, behind this, this disconnect? Well, I think that the disconnect comes in the 16th century. As we have uh, astronomers like uh, Nicholas Copernicus uh, and others beginning to observe the movement of the planets. And, you know, Nicholas was a Polish priest. Um, he was Catholic. That's, you know, right there. You know, you know that when he started looking at this stuff, he's going, oh, my God, you know, what am I going to do? Uh, this is a little this is a little tricky now because I think the earth is moving now uh, this was a tough one he was a good friend of the Pope and the Pope really liked him he's like Nick I like your work you know just don't publish that stuff okay so but others came along uh, Copernicus I mean got Copernicus um, Kepler Tycho Brahe and others you know and they said hey Nick you're right absolutely we're moving Right? We're moving with the other planets around the sun. This is not, here's the bottom line, this is not a geocentric universe. This is a heliocentric cosmos now that we know. Well, and, you know, as we know, the story goes, it did not go well for uh, the church. And, you know, here's the thing. You know, I always say it takes a good Italian because Italians are very kind of, you know, they'll just go right out there and put it out there. And Galileo really just had a much better telescope. Uh, he was more accurate in his observations, and he basically confirmed Copernicus's uh, observation of a heliocentric cosmos. And uh, he published a big book called The Doctrine of the Two World Systems just to try to say, hey, the Copernican system is correct, you know, but this does not conflict with scripture. You know, the Bible tells us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go, right? The Bible is not a science book. Uh, but Cardinal Bellarmine said, no, no, the doctrine attributed to Copernicus that the earth moves around the sun and the sun stands at the center of the world without moving from east to west, that is contrary to Holy Scripture and therefore cannot be defended or held. Therefore, Galileo, you are now placed under house arrest. I have to tell you, if you're going to be on a house arrest, Florence, Italy is the place to be. <laughs> Good food. I mean, the climate is wonderful. He just did not have any access to email or Twitter, so uh, we don't know what would have come out. You know, this was also the time of the Protestant Reformation, and what the Catholic Church was, in a sense, saying is, we don't want you interpreting Scripture. We don't want you telling us what Scripture, you know, how the world moves, because Scripture tells us how the world moves, and we're going to tell you how to read Scripture, right? And so that was, in a sense, behind this whole thing. But Galileo really, in a sense, marks a watershed, I think, in this relationship between science and religion. Up to the 16th century, quite honestly, um, theology was known as the queen of sciences. So natural philosophy, the study of astronomy, you know, the study of physics was part, in a sense, of doing theology. That's how you got your degree. You know, but Galileo, in a sense, is saying, uh, no, I think, you know, we need to take observation seriously. Science reveals the world as it really is, not just as an appearance. This is not just platonic appearances. We're not just an Aristotelian final causes. Now we can observe, we can, we can do experiments, and we can confirm things, our observations. So with Galileo, we see, in a sense, the rise of modern science. In a sense, the shift from the, not the why question, why does this happen, but how is it happening? So using causality, we can say we're moving from final causality, like everything moving towards its final end, to efficient causality. How do things work, you know? 
Um, and therefore, with Galileo, we have the beginning of a mechanical view of nature. And we also, you might say, now I have to say this, that um, uh, at least from the point of uh, you know, the Catholic Church, and I think uh, the Protestant churches were, you know, a, a li I could say along the same lines, a little bit ambivalent, you know, with the emphasis on scripture. Uh, the place of creation becomes a little bit less, you know, um, more in the background. But there was not this rejection. This rejection of, um, of science really is a much later thing. It's, it's really more 19th century than it was 16th century. So I just want to you know, kind of be clear that there wasn't just an outright, okay, we don't like scientists type thing. Um, there was, how, however, uh, sort of, we're not sure. What is this going to mean for us? But what happens with modern science then now becomes a new story. As scientists begin to observe, as they experiment, as they can begin now to answer questions that previously were answered by theology, you know, or, you know, as we say, the God of the gaps answer. How did this happen? I can't explain it. Maybe God just did it. You know, God does these things. That's a God of the gaps. We use God to fill in the gap of, of explanation. But now, um, Modern science began to, use, but with the introduction of mathematics, better mathematics, began to, in a sense, push God out of the cosmos. Uh, you know the famous question of Napoleon to Laplace, the mathematician. So where is God in your hypothesis? And his answer was, well, we now long, no longer have such a need to invoke uh, the place of God. Now we can explain things, you know, using mathematics. So God becomes, in a sense, you see marginalized, pushed more and more out of the cosmos as an unnecessary um, idea. And I think, I think a lot of our problems today are rooted in the 16th century and, and going forward. We live, in a sense, with a dual consciousness. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to give a diagnosis here, but we could make, make it sort of like as a functional schizophrenia. We work, you know, on an everyday value. But the fact is we have two minds. We have a religious consciousness, a religious mind, and a scientific mind. Our everyday lives in our everyday world are functioning mostly according to the principles of modern science. But you walk into the churches, you know, not, not here, this is an enlightened group, but I'm going to, you know, other churches, uh, you know, and, and we still have language and thought patterns of religion that are out of an entirely different cosmology not to mention, you know, theology. So we, we, have, been, we have been comfortable in this cognitive dissonance. Um, you know, the story kind of proceeds in the fact that the, uh, the move of God outside, you know, outside the cosmos, the, the, the shifting of things, the fact that the earth now is seen to be moving around the sun caused some to really question the whole area of knowledge. How can we know anything with any certainty? Certainly in the Middle Ages, we can know because we can observe the natural world. We can, in a sense, we can reflect on those observations. Descartes was a um, Jesuit trained, uh, brilliant mathematician. Uh, I, when I think of Descartes, and, and I think of someone who might have been just slightly neuralgic, quite honestly. You know, he just looked like he might have had a bad hair day someday. Um, but he was really concerned, how can I know anything for certain if it is moving? So Descartes, you know, what we do is, by the way, is when we can't get ourselves out of the impasse, we create, right? And he brilliantly conceived of the idea that, well, if I think and I exist, then I can logically deduce that, you know, there is self-thinking uh, thought, perfect being. If I exist, then there must be perfect being um, that is of mind, and that is God. And so Descartes basically strips the natural world of any sacred meaning. And he places that search for uh, meaning in the self-thinking subject. So the famous, you know, I think, therefore I am. Um, of course, he was very um, creative and had this notion that the soul was a thinking, uh, the thinking self-subject distinguished from the body. So you can see 
where the soul now, it's taking Aristotelianism you know, to the nth degree. It's its own form. It's its own thing. And it exists within the body. This moves us way out of, by the way, Hebraic thought. Right? You would never, the Hebrews would never have thought of the human person as a soul in a body. The Greeks did, however. So we have two things that are linked together. And how? For Descartes, through the pineal gland. Now, I'm sure you've thought about this already, right? You've probably thought about your own pineal gland, right? Who would think about that? You know, but the place of emotion, you know, the place where, um, you know, yeah. So anyway, there it is, the pineal gland linking things together. What happens then past Descartes? We have then not only the rise of a mechanical view of nature with Galileo, now we have the rise of a mechanical philosophy, right? Now we can, in a sense, open the way for science to proceed without restricting itself to what be quantified and measured. Because nature is now, uh, using Descartes' language, just extensive stuff. And we use this language today, right? I have so much stuff, you know? Stuff that's just inert matter. Um, and therefore, we could build principles around this inert matter. But God, for Descartes and others, was not part of this material world. So, you know, the British psychiatrist Ian McGilchrist, in, in looking at modern culture, began to uh, relate um, diagnoses from his own patients with, in a sense, where we are today in culture. And he uh, devised the idea that we have, in a sense, inherited a divided brain. Now, I hope there are no neuroscientists here because this is a very sketchy view of the brain, but it's very colorful, right? Just so you get the idea of things. Um, without going into any detail on the brain, the brain basically has two major hemispheres, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. Now, you can see here the very colorful, oops, excuse me. Oh my God, yes, here we are. There we are, the right hemisphere. Very colorful, um, love, poetry, freedom, passion, creativity. Right, so the right hemisphere is the hemisphere, the part of the brain that's connected with the body and therefore connected with the wider world. But you know, truthfully, how do we get input into the brain? Through our senses, right? So from that wider connection, we take in from into the senses and that information that goes to the left brain, that in a sense chops it into down, right? Into logic, analysis, reason, strategy, control. And what McGilchrist basically argues is that we, as with kind of a post-Cartesian world, we have, in a sense, become disconnected, right brain disconnected. Uh, and we have overused, overemphasized left brains. So the left brain is, in a sense, this is what Rami Shapiro, you know, says, uh, Rabbi Shapiro says, you know, the left brain is sort of the narrow brain. Because when we reduce everything to here are the bits, here's the bits of information, and then we stack up those bits and say, I hope we have enough, you know, to make our ends meet. The right brain, you know, is really the brain that says, hey, it's a party, everyone's invited. But when that brain starved, all we have is the data brain. And we're wondering, are we going to make it? You know, the left brain's like, I don't know if there's going to be enough for everyone, so I better store up my barns, you know, with my my own information and my stuff. The right brain, the spacious brain, you know, has an open invitation to life. And so we're basically good left brain people. And look at our world today. You know, we have built a wonderful left brain world. It's, it's very analytical. Uh, it's strategic. It's uh, very detailed, you know. And the thing is, like, as students will tell me, what do I need to know for the test? You know, give me the 10 points, right? Give me the five ways, you know, five ways to God, 10 points to know, 99 days are your money back, you know. Everything has some kind of numerical, quantitative, you know, um, aspect to it. Well, you know, I think part of this story is that as we move from the Middle Ages into the uh, Renaissance past, into the age of modernity, we begin to see that science begins to conquer space. That's one thing that happens, right? So God gets pushed out as we begin now to, anal to observe, to begin to measure. We can now talk about how the, hev you know, how the heavens are moving. We talk about the uh, different orbits of the planet. And so we begin to conquer space. Um, mind becomes separate from matter. 
uh, giving rise again to the kind of mechanical philosophy that still dominates our world. And now the world becomes a big machine. And, you know, Friedrich Nietzsche, the, the German philosopher, uh, I think in, in his own way, you know, he, he did proclaim, you know, God is dead. We have, in a sense, killed God. We have pushed God out of the world. And at one point he says in his essay, The Madman, he says, we have to become bigger than what we are to live within the cavity created by the death of God. We must become gods if we are to live in this world without God. And I think there, you know, and, and, you know, there's something to that, to, to Nietzsche's insight that is at the heart today of our culture. You know, we have to be gods, not just God-like. Now we have to fill that cavity by becoming superhuman, you know. Um, and I think Newton, you know, Newton's world builds on this mechanical notion of the world that if it's just you know, stuff that's interacting. Newton was one. Now, Newton was a deist. He was a, a very religious person, but he did not believe in the Christian notion of the Trinity. He was um, uh, an anti-Trinitarian um, known as a Socinian. So I don't know if there's any Socinians here, but that would you'd be in, at home with Newton. Um, this little sketch by M.C. Escher kind of I think, reflects Newton's world. In other words, for Newton, we are, in a sense, all of matter is irreducible uh, small particles, atom-like things, individual units that are connected to other units by universal laws, whether they're laws of gravity, whether they're laws of motion. And so with Newton's world, we can begin to map the terrain, the physical terrain of our world as one of lawfulness and order, law and order. The world is like a giant machine. This is our world today. This is the world we're actually beginning to, it's been our 20th century world in the 21st century. We're moving slowly but surely beyond it and I think we're resisting the changes because quite honestly, Newton's world is quite comfortable. All you have to do is find your little niche. You know, what's your cube? Um, you know, what's your space? Uh, and uh, you stay there. Whether it's you get a job, this is my job, you know, or in the family, this is where I am in the family. We don't think in terms of interrelated parts in Newton's world. We think only in terms of individual parts and how that part, you might say, functions in the whole. You work at a job as whatever, as a, you know, uh, CEO. And, oh, that's at the top. We don't put it at the top. Well, you work at a job as maybe a middle manager. And you say, that's my job. You know, that's what I do. And, uh, you know, someone comes in and says, well, you know, you're not really living up to you, what we expect of you in your job. You can be replaced, you know. Uh, and therefore, parts in Newton's world are replaceable. You know, we can take one part out and we put another place in. We put another part in. Um, and, and therefore, we don't realize the effect of any one part on the whole that we never look at how that person might be interacting on a broader level. But we, we do this, you know, even our ecclesial lives, our church lives are very Newtonian. Uh, I always give the example of going to church on Sunday because everyone basically sits in the same seat, you know, no matter where you are. And, and so, you know, everyone, you know, you have your, you go in, you find your seat, you sit down, you go through service. So you come in one Sunday, you know, and you're about... 10 minutes late and you go to your seat and you go, you're in my seat. You know, you look at the person, you're like, you're in my seat. I mean, there's no sign that says this is so-and-so's seat, right? But you're thinking to yourself, where am I going to sit now? Because, I mean, the whole, you have the whole rest of the church to find a place, but that doesn't matter. There's something about location. This is my place. This is where I, you know, this is what I do. This is where I sit. This is where I work. And so we don't like change in Newton's world. We want to stay where we are. And, and you know, we built our neighborhoods like this. This is my house. This is your house. If I want to be your neighbor, I'll go out and say hello. If I don't want to be your neighbor, I am not related to you. We hear this language today, right? I am not related to you. So I don't really care what happens to you. Welcome to Newton's world. We're very, very good Newtonians. Um, and the Newtonian world 
has been very helpful to build a world of industry, a world of progress, uh, because you know this is how corporations are built. And so we have this mechanistic world. We're very good mechanistic people. Just you know, people say, just tell me what I need to, to know, you know, and I'll just do it. I know I don't want to know anything more. And so a mechanistic world of Newton's world is a closed system, right? It doesn't do well with change. That's the whole thing. And so people are like, oh, God, more change again. You know, I know in the Catholic Church when Vatican II came, people were like, oh, my God, you know, all this change, 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 change. I can't stand it anymore. You know, I just want to go home and want to just sit in my own little house and please do not talk to me about any more change. Uh, and so why? Because we like worlds being certain. We like them being predictable. We like them having, we like a certain control over our worlds. We are a Newtonian world with Newtonian people, are control people. You know, we like to know, you know, what's going to be the outcome here. We're single vision. You know, this is what I'm interested in. Do not block, you know, do not send me all your ideas on everything. All right? I, don't, I can't deal with it. Single vision, objective reality. What's the point? All right? What are you, what are you, what are you telling us here? So um, what's the problem with a closed system that's single vision, that's control-oriented? It has no room or capacity for inner transformation. That's our world today. Our world, as we'll see, is actually just urging. It's, it's, just, it's, kind of, it's got this compulsion for transformation. And there's a strong resistance, you know, because we're still quite comfortable in our particular uh, cubes. So in, an, in a Newtonian world of absolute causality, uh, in a sense, there's no rule. I'm going to just um, last point here. There's no role for human consciousness. We're detached observers, you know. And again, you know, you hear this. I mean, you, you can see this in the culture. You know, we sit back and we're like, well, I'm just going to take this in. You know, I'm just going to see what happens. Uh, I'm not going to get involved, you know, because I'm not sure here, you know, what, what's going to, you know, what's gonna, this going to mean. And, you know, if it doesn't work, hey, I've got my space. I'm good. You know, everything's fine. All right. Well, you know, as Barbara Taylor Brown says, you know, our churches became like this as well. We're Newtonian churches, clear across the board. Uh, no, no, again, I mean, there, I bet there's churches here that are more progressive, but... Let me just say, for the most part, Protestant and Catholic, and I would say as well Jewish and Muslim, you know, you walk in and you'll hear God described as predictably as one who behaves as Newton's universe. So you believe in God, you will be saved. Sin against God, you'll be condemned. You know, say you're sorry, you'll be forgiven. Obey the law, you'll be blessed. Right? A Newtonian religion says, okay, I went to church, you know, I gave, I gave money to the church, I prayed, why did God allow this to happen to me? That's a Newtonian religious question, right? I did my part. Why did not God do God's part? You know, and so um, that's a problem. This is, in a sense, how I think God is depicted. And a lot of our, our concepts of God, our image of God, um, here I can, you know, for my part, thank all the stained glass windows I grew up with, you know, uh, over and over again. God as the elderly, you know, the grandfather, you know, the elderly paternal figure, benevolent, of course, you know, watching over God's children from above, from a distance. And what do we hope for? That we can die and go to heaven and be with this God, with his grandfather. And I think, and what do you plan to do there forever and ever? You know, uh, you know, is heaven an endless, endless world of ice cream sundaes or sleep-ins? You know, I don't know. I'm not sure. But we have, you know, that this notion, I mean, and I think, again, Protestant Catholic alike, four pillars that governed us, death, judgment, heaven, hell. Do not pass go. Do not collect 200. Do not drink on Friday. Do not swear. Do not, or you are forever, ever, ever going into Dante's world you know, of the inferno. And so we became very narrow focused. So not only, not only Newtonian left brain people, but religiously, you know, left brain as well. You know, kind of keeping a guarded eye. I better not do this or it's not going to go well for me. 
So as my friend Jack Hott says, you know, a religion built on stability and immutability is not prepared for a cosmic order based on change. And that is true of religion today. All religions, and I'm going to say all monotheistic faiths, are built on an old cosmology. And they have not dealt well with modern science and the insights of modern science today. But here's what I want to say. We have become, in a sense, lost in space. I think we have become detached from the whole, from the cosmos, uh, which is the whole order, physical order, spiritual order. Um, and in a sense, my guide, uh, Teilhard de Chardin, the wonderful Jesuit paleontologist who spent a lifetime trying to bring together evolution and faith, said at one point, you know, the artificial separation, artificial separation between humans and cosmos is at the root of our contemporary moral confusion. We simply do not know anymore how to read the stars. We no longer know, in a sense, that spiritual wholeness of the whole. Uh, and I think we are, in a sense, lost in space. And in fact, I might even go f so far to say as we have become the most unnatural species alive today on the planet, the human species. Uh, our minds are elsewhere in terms of religion, uh, and our sense of the whole is, is all is disconnected. So I think one thing we have to do is to awaken, first of all, to our physical home. Uh, if we're even going to talk about religion or God as creator, uh, you know, even Thomas Aquinas, you know, kind of I got the idea that a mistake about creation is a mistake about God. You, you, you know, you can't talk about a creator God if you're not going to talk about creation, and creation not as some abstract idea, but the reality of what exists. And so we need to take a little spin through, you know, modern science in its three main levels the large, the small, and the complex. Now, you know, unlike the medieval cosmos, we do not live in a heliocentric or, or geocentric static immutable cosmos. We live in something much larger. If I can just maybe look at it here and we'll go back one. This is our home. I don't know if you recognize it, but it is the home that is actually we're a part of. Um, now, this home, let me just go back one. You know, this home came into being because of uh, a young man in a, in a Swiss patent office who had a C-rated job, had a great imagination, was a mathematical genius, and began to wonder about light and traveling and motion at the speed of light. And that was Albert Einstein. And Einstein was unhappy, you know, with Newton's concepts of absolute space and absolute time. And as he began to reflect uh, on these things, he, you know, and reflect, I mean, by that, I mean he really began to develop a new mathematics of, of light particles. You know, he began to reflect on energy. And uh, there's a whole series of experiments. I mean, he's not the only one. As people began to look at electromagnetism uh, in terms of light waves, light particles. Um, but what Einstein did is he really upturned Newton's universe by showing that space and time are not fixed. They are not separate. But, you know, quite honestly, that's how we think still, because we're still quasi-Newtonians. We think in time, space. But Einstein said, no, on the large scale, it's space-time. And space-time, you might say, is a dimension of a multi-dimensional universe. And in a sense, gravity is the mass of objects that can bend this space-time. So you think to yourself, wow, this is very different from Newton's Legos universe, you know. This is more like a Gumby universe or a bazooka bubblegum universe, you know. This is a universe that's stretchy. Uh, and therefore, what scientists over the 20th century, uh, it's been remarkable, a remarkable century of discoveries, that we can trace back this space-time continuum, you know, back to a point. I mean, mathematics breaks down. They call this the singularity where, in a sense, now we can speculate at the, at the quote-unquote beginning. You know, is that a real, a true beginning? Is that beginning, in a sense, an emergence out of a previous universe or out of a black hole? That's really, I leave that to the cosmologist, because that, those are uh, questions unanswered. But we can say that this universe we occupy had a hot, dense beginning. 
and the hot density could have been something like a quantum soup, you know, where a high energy, you know, small, the Higgs boson particle idea, the field, uh, the glue field that kind of was so hot and dense that it sort of rapidly expanded. In its rapid expansion, the forces of the universe began to be placed, put in place. Um, and therefore, this universe has been cooling off ever since and expanding. So we live in a cool, expanding universe, literally. Um, space, in a sense, is what's being formed in the expansion. And that's something that we're like, huh, really? What is it expanding into? It's not expanding into space. That, and so science gets a little strange, I have to tell you. Um, time, it takes immense amounts of time for stars and planets to form. So, you know, I always say to people, look, at if you're feeling old today, you know, and the psalmist says 70 for most, 80 if you're strong, 90 with good drugs, and if you're a transhumanist, you know, you'll be 150. That is just merely, merely a wink, not even a wink of an eye in a universe that's about 13.8 billion years old. Billion years old. And here's the sobering reality. It will continue to expand, perhaps indefinitely. Perhaps in nine trillion years, the sun will burn out. You know, but all we know is that we need to rethink the second coming, okay? Because it's not going to come anytime soon. Uh, it, it's just an indefinite future of expansion. Uh, and so it's a hot Big Bang universe. It's very large. Uh, our, we are on a mid-sized Milky Way galaxy. So we're sort of a suburban galaxy, galaxies being collections of stars surrounded by millions and millions of galaxies grouped together. It is rather fantastic. You know, if you've ever seen the night sky, if you were to kind of flip, you might say, flip the Earth upside down, you know, instead of us standing here and looking up there, if we were to stand there and, you know. So it's just an incredible an incredible home that we're in. The expanding universe, in a sense, is known by us because we ourselves can expand with it. So <clears throat> this may, it may be our greatest cosmic test. You know. Now we know on the, um, on, that's the, the large scale snippet. The, the micro scale, the small scale, the fundamental levels of, of reality are even stranger. You know, for so long, we've talked about matter, and still today, certainly in the area of theology, we use language like nature, being, you know. And I'm saying, well, what is being? What is nature? What are you be talking about here? From the point of science, we're saying today that, you know, the world, and again, this is based on studies of light, you know, physical light, that the world is fundamentally energy. And, you know, the early 20th century experiments where, um, if I just go one here and go back, you know, where they would shoot a um, beam of electrons through a slit. You know, certainly if you shoot through one slit, you should see one beam of electrons. But when they started putting two slits, you know, on a wall and, and shot that beam of electrons, they had this strange interference pattern. And scientists began to, to realize, you know, we can't really tell if it's a wave or a particle uh, unless we measure it. And so this notion of, quantum reality, these packets of energy, quanta, that, you know, have this very strange property of being both wave and particle simultaneously. Because the only way we can say what something is, is if we observe it, right? The acts of observation makes a determination. So this is Einstein's, you know, one outcome of his relativity theory is that, guess what? Matter and energy are not two separate things. We kind of know this, but then we don't, you know, because we still ask language like, if we think of body and soul language, right, which would be kind of an equivalent. You know, people say, well, when I die, what happens to my body? You know, my, my soul goes to God and my body's in the ground. Well, you're a very good Cartesian dualist, right? Um, but you need to get up to speed with uh, what we now know about matter, right? Because all energy is matter, and all matter is energy. They are interconvertible. Um, all you have to do is take a drop of water, right? And you heat the water, massive water, 
Um, you heat it, it becomes vapor, different energy state. You freeze it, it becomes ice. So different energy states, same matter, retains the same mass. And so that's the kind of world we're living in. It's, it's really strange. It's a world of possibilities. And what we're beginning to realize today in the 1950s, James Jean says, you know, we thought for so long that the mind is something that we humans have and that matter is something that's objective out there and we can just determine it by our minds. Now he says, hmm, mind appears not as an accident intruder into the realm of matter, but mind may be the creator and governor of the realm of matter. Gene says the quantum phenomenon makes it possible to say that the background of the universe is mind-like. That's like, huh? What? What was this guy drinking, right? You know? Uh, and that's, in a sense, what science is opening up today. This world of quantum reality, this world of matter is not just discrete stuff or inert stuff. What we're realizing, it's rather complex webs of energy relational fields uh, so that we can say that cosmic life is intrinsically relational. Now, here's the thing. The term interconnectedness is the most apt description of the fundamental levels of reality. We are, in a sense, fields within fields within fields. And you know, Albert Einstein really had a lot of problems with quantum physics as the Copenhagen School, governed by Niels, Niels, uh, Niels Bohr, described it. Einstein did not like the idea of indeterminacy in nature, which is what Heisenberg posited, you know, that, hey, if this is just a realm of, you know, uh, probabilities of wave-particle duality, uh, well, and we measure something, we make a determination, well, that determination may tell us where the position is, but as soon as we name that, we alter its velocity or its momentum. So Heisenberg says there's, in, you know, there's indeterminism in nature. And Einstein was like, nine. I don't, li I don't like this idea at all. God does not play dice. And so, you know, the thing is, it's always good to have postdoc students because they're, they have to get a degree. So they have to come up with something creative. You know, so Einstein said, you know, well, let's think this through. So his... They did this thought experiment with two postdocs, and he said, let's take two particles that have interacted, all right? These two particles have interacted, and we split them apart, all right? We place one particle here on this ledge, you know, here in the University of North Georgia, and we'll place the other particle on the planet Kepler. What happens if we were to turn this particle 180 degrees up? His, his student said, I bet the, the particle on Kepler will turn 180 degrees down. Now, prior to, you know, to the notion of quantum physics, this would have been a ridiculous idea. And indeed, this was later shown to be true by the by physicist John Bell, that what we call quantum entanglement, particles that have interacted are forever interacting, and one part, they can affect one another uh, even across vast distances, or what we call spooky action at a distance. Uh, and therefore, you know, the example I always use is of consciousness, right? Because I think consciousness, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, but it's also following kind of the, these kind of principles of entanglement. Uh, if you think of consciousness as the flow of information across fields. Uh, if you've interacted with someone, like, you know, you worked with someone that you really enjoyed, you know, or you had a good friend, and, you know, you were together, you know, for a few years here in Georgia, and then that person retired and moved on to Florida. And then you haven't heard from that person, say, for about a year or so. And then one day you're thinking, gee, I wonder how Sue is doing. You know, I wonder, you thought, I wonder how Sue is doing. About half an hour, you get an email from Sue. Hi, thinking about you. Or the phone call, you know, hi, I was just thinking about you. And you say, you know, what a coincidence. I was just thinking about you too. And we used to say before we thought it was just a coincidence. Now we can say we are quantumly entangled, right? So... Bottom line is, do make sure you know who you're interacting with because you are forever interacting, right? So we don't realize now the extent, this is a whole new paradigm of the way our lives are impacting uh, nature. We call, you know, from the point of physics today, we can say that reality is non-local, meaning that an action here or a change here can affect something at a vast distance that's sort of invisible to the, to the physical eye. In a sense, nature is composed not of so much of material substance, but again, entangled fields of energy.
So that from the point of physics, we can say the nature of the universe, I mean, here we're talking about the fundamental fabric of the universe, is undivided wholeness. This notion, I mean, the whole advent of quantum physics, the whole notion of this idea that change is part and parcel now of the physical fabric of life moves us from the Newtonian world of closed systems, a closed system being self-contained, right? Little exchange with the environment. You know, it's like, uh, do not, you know, do not tell me too many ideas. I've got my world all set. You know, the closed system is, says, I put energy in the system, I use the energy up, no new energy, the system will die out. In a sense, a lot of our churches today have been closed systems. Um, and and they're, not, they're not doing all that well. A clo an open system is a system that's far from equilibrium. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, everything was strive for equilibrium. Now we should say strive for chaos, right? Because chaos, you know, following chaos theory means that our, you know, that change, local change, fluctuations. The system does have a pattern of order, but if it's open to the environment, uh, that system can be affected then by the environment. There can be a spontaneous change within the system. And over time, that system can be pulled into a new pattern of order. So open systems are, in a sense, order arising out of disorder. A Newtonian world doesn't do well with disorder, right? It, it treats it as a failure. An open system can look at disorder as the potential of new life and new possibilities. So, you know, that's, in a sense, our, micro, our world today. Paul Dirac, in 1933, at one of those dinners they have, you know, before the Nobel Prize, he says, you know, it's such an interconnected world. I mean, really, from the point of energy, that if you pick a flower on Earth, you will move the farthest star. And you go, what? Pick a flower on Earth, move a star? Seriously? Well, how many stars have we moved? How many galaxies have we pushed aside, you know? We don't even realize the extent of our actions. You know, and, and sometimes I like to, in a sense, draw analogously on the human level because we, we live our lives like quasi-Newtonians. We do not realize that even our thoughts can have an impact at a distance. Uh, and therefore, we do not realize that our thoughts, for example, of hate, our thoughts of, you know, um, of jealousy, our thoughts of I can't forgive, that those negative thoughts, what if we were to realize that those negative thoughts have had an impact on the emergence of war in Iraq, on the emergence of a drought in the South Sudan? And we're thinking, huh, that's really crazy. No, it isn't. Not in this universe that we occupy today. So David Bohm, the contemporary of Einstein said, you know, as humans and societies, we seem separate. But in our roots, we are part of an indivisible whole, and we share in the same cosmic process. Jews, Muslims, Christians, atheists, Russians, Afghanis, Chinese, you name it, we are all sharing in the same cosmic whole of cosmic life. And we would be astounded, I think, if we were to flip the fabric of our universe inside out and to see just how interrelated we are. Um, so we are moving from a mechanistic universe to a holistic universe. Uh, and you know, again, just taking this, we've been happy with a world that's deterministic, certain, predictable, and controllable. And we are not doing well in a world of indeterminacy, of uncertainty, of ambiguity, of trust. Our world today is a holistic world that requires a shift in how we think about what we're thinking about. It requires a shift in the basic structure of our openness to life. Um, and you might say, here's just the third part of this openness. We are not static fixed, like it or not. Now, evolution is a, is a word that still is difficult for a lot of people. Uh, more than 40% here in the US, uh, and here it be largely evangelical population, but I'm not going to say exclusively, do not accept evolution as the way that the human species, homo sapiens, have come about. 
a uh, number of years ago, we were we were had a young woman visiting us, and she said she was evangelical, and she said, "Well, so what are you working on?" She asked me, and I said, "Well, I'm working on." Christianity and evolution. She said, oh, evolution, she said, that's just a myth. That's just a story. Uh, I said, well, it's more than a story. I mean, a lot of our modern life is based on principles of evolution, you know, including how we're here. She said, oh, no, she said, well, you know, when it comes to religion, God created Adam and Eve less than 10,000 years ago and placed them here on the earth. And I said, no, that was a story that was told and it's time, you know, that's how they understood the world of its time. Now we, we have a better insight to things. She said, no, that is what happened. And I said, well, it was really nice knowing you, so I shall pray for you, you know, and um, be on your merry way. So what evolution means, it's like evolution really is like the unfolding of a scroll. That's really what we're talking about, and this is very consonant with what we know about from cosmology about our Big Bang universe. It's like things unfold. That's what it means. And so it's not a static, fixed universe. It's dynamic and changing. And so the term process adequately describes the changes here. If you, those of you who like books, you might consider this evolutionary story in terms of an encyclopedia, uh, each volume having 450 pages and each page a million years. This is a little sobering, this story. Volume 1 is the Big Bang. Okay, Volume 21, that means 20 volumes later, is the Earth. So our Earth, our planet Earth, is a relative newcomer uh, in terms of planetary life. Uh, we'll just jump to volume 30. The dinosaurs go extinct on page 385. Now, I don't know about you, but I was in the Pittsburgh air, uh, airport a few months ago coming down the escalator, and I saw this huge skeleton of a brontosaurus, and I thought, that can't be a near neighbor, you know, in this story. I mean, that's unbelievable that actually Jurassic Park is closer than we think it is. But that's what we're saying. You know, volume 30, page 450, the last line and the last two words of the last line are human beings. That would be you and me. And guess what? There's no period, right? There's no end of story. Thanks for reading this book. You know, rather, we are in evolution. We are in a world of change and complexity. That's what evolution means, that given sufficient time and the right conditions, new things will happen, emergence, novelty in nature. That's what, in a sense, we're talking about. Time is irreversible. We do not get younger. You know, we do not go backwards. We're going towards, we're moving towards this kind of trend of more complexity. And that's what nature is about. It's sort of moving in this interacting forces of organic interdependence. And so I know this is, again, a little shocking, but this is from the Smithsonian. If you're interested in evolution, the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. has a fabulous exhibit on human origins. It is sobering as we look, as we move from four-legged to two-legged, you know, tracing back from Australopithecus, um, you know, Homo neanderthalus, Homo nephaldi, the latest, you know, discovery, into Homo sapiens, our species. Today we know even genetically there has been intermarriage between Homo neanderthalus and Homo sapiens. And some of those gene types are expressed in sunburning, in belly fat, you know, which belong to Neanderthals. And you're like, oh, wow. I thought she's supposed to be a Franciscan sister, you know. So it's not a background to a story. It is our story. And here's the basis of the story. Evolution says to us, that the, the whole of life is open to more life, more complex life. It is an unfinished story. This is not the end of it. It's not conclusion. We are not just being, we are not just being created, we are creating. We're part of the creation and evolution. Life itself is constantly emerging towards the future, again, by how? By creative power. And because, you know, religious people, uh, religious people are so, you know, I don't want, but what's our fastest evolver today? Technology, right? Religious people are like, oh, no, we can't take that evolution stuff. Oh, no, we like the 16th century. We love Newton. We want to stay in this world. Go to California. They're happy to take the reins here. Now, I grew up in New Jersey, right? So, you know, uh, I was in New Jersey, and remember in the 70s, and 
we had phones on the wall. You might have had those here in Georgia, right? So, you know, someone calls and, you know, you can only go so far with the phone on the wall. And someone said, you know, you're not going to believe this, but they're going to make ATT is coming out with a phone you could hold in your hand. I'm like, really? And they're like, yeah, they're going to be able to walk around with a phone. I'm like, wow. So this 12-foot thing came around. You know, it was like this big. And, you know, you had to be really special to get one. And then people said, now, this is even better. They're going to make phones with computers in them. I'm like, what's a computer? You know, who ever heard of that? And here we are in a very short amount of time. We have leapt like a rabbit across the fields of imagination and creativity. Today, we have a computer in our hand. We can connect at the touch of a button around the world. It is an entirely new cosmos with this technology. And we're going to talk more about this this afternoon. I just wanted to point out here that the ecology movement and AI movements basically emerged around the same time. We still are in the 60s and 70s with regard to the environment. Technology has moved at an exponential speed, you know, from the 60s into the 21st century. But uh, we know evolution continues because Half the species is in evolution, right? It's all developmental time. So um, all of this to say, using now Teilhard, I'm going to bring Teilhard more in, in our second talk, but Teilhard Desjardins looked at this as a man of faith, you know, one steeped in the Jesuit charism in Ignatian spirituality, uh, and he said, look, we are no longer the center of this universe, but we are the arrow. We are, in a sense, as far as we know, the intelligent species who can step apart from this process and reflect on it. We know that we know. And therefore, it does make a difference how we know and what we know. It makes a difference for where we're going in terms of evolution. So he says, the human now holds a frontier position in this unfolding universe. So um, we probably should take a, um, should we take a little uh, breather here? Would that be good for you? Yeah, let's take a breather. Okay, thanks.